My, my presentation is linked data in actions, Tampa portals in for digital humanities. And as mentioned, I come from Aalto University and the University of Helsinki. Heldig is a digital humanities center that was established four years ago at the University of Helsinki, and, and it really has changed the scheme, I think, in Finland. It was a major, major funding event. 10 million euros were casted suddenly to digital humanities and, and eight new professorships were established in the university. So it, I have been very honored to be able to work in this center now for four years. So my contents are about uh, our work in Finland for a very long time. We have been working actually on these, these topics at the Semantic Computing Research Group that that is active both at Aalto and, and University of Helsinki. I will first motivate a little bit about the linked data. Why is it good for digital humanities in my mind? And then the vision of building uh, infrastructure for digital humanities that I think is really needed. And uh, I was very happy to hear that, that also you in Germany have this kind of, of activities. Errol, uh, and just a little, a little question. We only see your uh, home screen, uh, but not your presentation. Is this correct? Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I, I think I have to. So I come from Heldig, uh, where we develop the digital world together at the University of Helsinki and, and uh, Helsinki area in general and beyond. So uh, the motivation is first given then the vision of building this uh, linked open data infrastructure for digital humanities. And then about the realization, what is this in practice? How do we create and use such an infrastructure? And then uh, we have used the infrastructure for various things and, and in the digital humanities, especially on building uh, the sample series of semantic portals that are the main topic of, of, of my, my presentation here. And the main takeaway of this presentation is thing, I think that, that in, in Sampo, Serious. we try to demonstrate a paradigm shift in publishing cultural heritage contents from text publishing to knowledge discovery and even artificial intelligence based systems. So in uh, our definition, we see digital humanities as, as, uh, as something as a discipline in the crossroads of computer science, humanities and social sciences. Uh, and, and linked data can be illustrated by this, this image here. So I think there are two webs avail available at the moment, one for the humans and one for the machines. So the traditional web that can be called web of pages contains tens of billions of, of web pages that you can search and then browse by using the links that link the pages together. But inside the web that we are using as humans, there is the web for machines, the web of data that is based on, on, on linking different concepts and data sets together, like the content of Wikipedia, the data there, and so on. So we, you have probably all seen this, this uh, linked open data cloud that uh, where this, in this bubble C, every bubble is a data set, like a Wikipedia based data set here. And it's interlinked then to other data sets uh, in order to enrich it. And this kind of, of, uh, of uh, linked data world is, is already there. Uh, for example, two, two years ago, uh, there were uh, statistics about 10,000 data sets in this cloud with 150 billion triples. And a triple is a connection between two entities, like, like that German is in Europe. This is one one, in, one uh, connection between the concepts of, of uh, Germany and Europe. And this is not something that we have invented, but the big boys have entered the game as well. So people are now very, very enthusiastic about these knowledge graphs that are the, the data structures inside the web of data. So why linked open data then? I think there are three good reasons for using it. The first is, is uh, to enrich everybody's data collaboratively from data, separate data silos. So the idea is that everybody wins by collaboration because if I put my data in the cloud, then my data is automatically enriched by other people's contents. The other good reason is that, that by using linked data, your value, the value of your data increases because you can create findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So the famous FAIR principles of, of publishing and using data apply very well in the linked data world. And finally, and, and probably most importantly, because now by using uh, linked data, the machine can understand the content that it's dealing with 
it, it means in practice that it's possible to create more intelligent applications and, and in a more cost effective ways. So both applications for the public curators and researchers, this is important. The vision that has driven us ahead uh, is to create a national, national linked open data infrastructure for cultural heritage and digital humanities in Finland. Uh, previous generations and, and also current generations are building different kind of infras like railroads, electrical networks, telecom networks and so on. So this is one world of inf infrastructures, but I think that now in the web of uh, li linked uh, open world, we, we, have, we have the uh, network of, of open data, which is a kind of infrastructure as well. So kind of, kind of uh, network of, of data or, or pipelines of data by which you can then, then connect data with each other and use it in a, same, in a little bit similar way as, as railroads, for example, are used. So what is this in practice? So uh, there are many elements that you have to create in order to make such an infrastructure. And, and here's a kind of picture that I try to draw here to summarize the things. First of all, one has to use some kind of web standards and best practices. And for example, we are leaning on the standards of the World Wide Web Consortium that is coordinating the development of the web in general. So standards and best practices, you can find them in, in the W3C web pages, for example. Then by using these standards, we need to create some kind of models for history or whatever you are modeling there. So we need data models and, and there are lots of uh, variety as well available, but we are using, for example, Dublin core based systems for, for, doc, for, for representing different kind of documents and then event based approach as, as advocated by CIDOC CRM. For, for example, historical events. So, so we are using more and more the CIDOC CRM today than, than uh, Dublin core like uh, formats. But these formats are also very useful because lots of the data that we are dealing with are actually documents. Then it doesn't make, to sense, make uh, much sense to, to, to sort of not use document based data models as well. Then lots of software tools are of course needed. Uh, for example, FUSEC is, is a tool for, for creating uh, triple stores on the web. Sample UI is something that we have created for, for creating the user interfaces and so on. There are lots of tens of different kind of libraries, JavaScript and other libraries that we are, for example, using in these systems. Then more important, uh, then what kind of applications or services then are we creating on the web? Uh, ontology services, this is where what we actually started. We, in, in Finland, we started to create ontologies from existing different vocabularies in different fields of, of life. Uh, and and uh, like, like in libraries, they all, always have, have a keyword thesauri, for example, for indexing publications in the libraries. And uh, uh, this is one thing. And, and I think that it's very important that one not only publishes the ontologies as data, but as operational services. And our vision here is that actually the on ontology services that we have created and that are in use in Finland at the moment are operational. So that, for example, a museum or an archive can connect its legacy systems to these uh, services there and, and get help for, for, for example, data indexing purposes there. So ontology services is one key there. Then, of course, we also need uh, data services and data sets. So these are very important as, as we aggregate the infrastructure so that we can reuse the same data sets that somebody publishes in, in different kind of context again and again. And we have developed this Link Data Finland platform where we have uh, practically everything that we have created have been published on this, this, uh, this uh, server farm, so to say. And then of course, the important thing is the applications uh, that you create based on all this stuff that you have here on the infrastructure, sample series, and, and we will be demonstrating those in a moment. Of course, this is only, only sort of technical infrastructure. And I, I also draw here human infrastructure, because this is very important. This is new technology and new way of thinking in humanities in many ways. So we also have to have to take care that people understand what is happening here and, and motivate them and, and to test them. Uh, it's, it's not so easy to uh, sort of make some kind of, of changes in the, in the existing ways people have been uh, familiar with. And uh, that's very important. We need educational dimension, for example, here, so that so that we can we can get the new generation and those who are interested really using this technology, confident that this is something useful and 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 how to 
do the trick, so to say. Uh, then the realization part uh, in practice. I think I, I show here a video about the infrastructure. I am Eero Hyönen from the Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities, Helsinki, University of Helsinki and the Aalto University. I hope you can hear it. A short presentation overviews our work on building a national link to open data infrastructure and applications for digital humanities. The work has been done at the Semantic Computing Research Group SECO in collaboration with computer scientists, researchers in humanities and social sciences, cultural heritage organizations and companies. First, the vision of building a semantic web infrastructure in Finland is outlined. After this, work on ontology and linked data services are presented, as well as the sample series of semantic portals based on them. This work demonstrates a paradigm shift for publishing cultural heritage content from printed texts up to artificial intelligence-based systems. Our work has been driven by the vision that a shared linked open data infrastructure is needed for creating cross-domain, cross-organizational cultural heritage of applications for digital humanities. Creating such an infrastructure started in 2003 in the National Ontology Service Project FinOnto that lasted 10 years and was funded by some 50 Finnish organizations. The need for an ontology infrastructure became evident when we created the Museum Finland system that aggregated and published collection data from different Finnish museums. After the National Ontology Project, the focus spread into linked data services, data analysis and digital humanities research. Today, our work forms the initiative Linked Open Data Infrastructure for Digital Humanities in Finland. We work on modeling history-related phenomena and contents using the event-based approach on developing linked data and ontology services and on open source tooling. For this purpose, ontologies for historical places, persons, times, events and keyword concepts are needed over and over again. We also foster education related to these technologies. To test and demonstrate the feasibility of the infrastructure, a series of 12 semantic portals has been created and six new ones are underway. We call them SAMPO portals because they are based on the so-called SAMPO model for publishing and using cultural heritage data on the semantic web. The SAMPO model is based on a shared linked data infrastructure, a collaborative data publishing business model, tools for building user interfaces, and a model for solving research problems. The name SAMPO comes from the Finnish epic Kalevala, where the mysterious SAMPO artifact is a metaphor for amazing technology that brings its own riches and good fortune. The sample portals have had millions of users. For example, book sample on fiction literature data deployed by the Finnish public libraries had 2 million users last year. War sample on the Second World War history based on contents from the National Archives, Defense Forces and other organizations has had over 740,000 users. Name Sampo, containing 2 million historical Finnish place records. Biography Sampo, with over 30,000 biographies of the Finnish Literary Society. And War Victim Sampo, on Finnish Civil War data, have had tens of thousands of users each. The latest Sampo in 2020, mapping manuscript migrations, is a transatlantic system for aggregating and publishing data of over 200,000 medieval and Renaissance manuscripts from the Bodleian Library of the University of Oxford, Schoenberg Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, and Institute for Research and History of Texts in Paris. At the moment, six new samples are being developed. For example, Fine Sample is a system targeted for archaeologists and citizen science metal detectorists using the collections of the Finnish Heritage Agency, including collaborations with the British Museum and the Pan-European Ariadne Plus project. Law Sampo publishes Finnish legislation and case law on the semantic web 
in collaboration with the Ministry of Justice. The Parliament sample system is being developed in collaboration with the Parliament of Finland. Our goal is to publish Finnish parliamentary discussions and related data in an intelligent web service for researchers of political culture and the general public. The sample model and portals aim at making a paradigm change in publishing and using cultural heritage content on the web. The contents are published as linked data and also integrated seamlessly with intelligent tools for data analysis. In our vision, artificial intelligence should help the user in solving research problems and also in finding new ones using creative AI methods. It would be important that the system can also explain its reasoning. In Douglas Adams' novel Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the computer was asked, what is the meaning of life? The answer 42 may be right, but the researcher in humanities would also like to know why. In my mind, a reusable shared linked open data infrastructure is the key for successful digital humanities work. More information, publication and links to different samples and infrastructure services can be found on the home pages of the Semantic Computing Research Group. Okay, so, so that was a kind of introduction to this, this uh, area. And, uh, and to summarize it, uh, why infrastructure? And I, we are using here, here uh, the Berliner Albert Einstein <laughs> stand on his, his shoulder, so to say. He once said that intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And I think that this is fundamentally what, what we are also trying to be here, a kind of geniuses, because I think that uh, if we can prevent the problems of interoperability and, and, uh, and help people creating data in the first place in an interoperable way and, and in, in a computer understandable way, then it would be very easy to create systems, systems like Sampo uh, afterwards. So the Sampo model that we have been using, uh, this is something that have, has developed very, very slowly, but, but now, now we have it sort of ready and it, it's been used in, in, in the sample. So it's something uh, that helped us that we, we not only sort of, uh, or it, it gives us a kind of framework how to create these samples because we are not a big group and, and we have been able to create so many samples. And, and the reason is that, that we are trying to sort of standardize also the way in which these systems can be created. And the sample model is based on, on, a, on a data publishing model uh, uh, that will be explained later. And then, then we, for creating the actual portals on the web, we have this sample UI framework, which is also a software package openly available. So this is open source software, where the idea is that we provide the end user with multiple perspectives to the single data set, which is in Sparkle endpoint. And then we have a, a way of using the data as well, sort of standardized. So we have a two-step filter analyze cycle. Uh, for using using the, the system. So, so we are using this kind of, of sort of uh, similar kind of, of, of way of, of uh, using the systems, which I think is also, also very useful. And, and it's easy for people to understand how the system will work then. So the, here's the model of, of publishing the data. The idea is that we have here in the middle uh, the ontology and data infrastructure, and then on the outer rim of the sample here, are uh, the different content providers like museums, land survey, archives, linked data, cloud, citizens, libraries, media companies, and so on. And the big idea here is, is very simple actually, that if we have this kind of ontology infrastructure, and if these guys from the library, uh, for example, uh, put their piece of information into this, this sample here, the red circle here, it is automatically interlinked with the other, other people's content here. So these guys in the library, their data gets enriched by the data linking. And at the same time, everybody else here is get, getting richer because they get a new linkage also to the new piece of information here. So this is a win-win situation where everybody wins. The content providers win because they can enrich each other's, to uh, other's content uh, freely. And, and also by reason, it is also good to remember that, that the semantics of the linked data is based on logic. So you can, you can also use AI-based tools for reasoning new data. And then for content users, of course, you get more linked interlinked data 
by this kind of systems and more intelligent applications because based on this kind of data it's much more easier to develop these applications. There are of course also challenges in this kind of, of, of scenario of, of distributed content provision. Uh, so for example these guys in, in libraries, museums, they have to agree more on the standards and practices on which they produce the data, which is not necessarily easy. So everybody has to take into account also other, other people and, and not, not just work for themselves. And there's also, of course, the learning curve in these new technologies that, that have to be taken into account. These libraries don't have, for example, in their technology stack, as they say, for example, linked data services or linked data triple stores and so on. So you have to have to first sell <laughs> this kind of ideas also to the IT personnel there, which may be difficult. Okay, this is a sample framework then the software also. It's, it's also also a new paper you can find it find it for if you're interested in, 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 in using the, the sort of the software as well. Uh, where the idea is to provide multiple ap application perspectives to a link, single link data service and, and the filter analyze two step, step usage cycle there. This system has actually been used also not only by ourselves, but for example, by Norwegians, they, they have created a national service of, of uh, historical places that is now in, uh, they are running in, in Norway. And also some companies have, have, have taken a copy of this software and, and are using it for their own software development. So the idea here is that, that, that we have everything in, in a linked data uh, service and, every, and then we have different kind of application views to the single data graph here. And uh, we only use Sparkle endpoint here. This is important. So, so we, we make a complete uh, separation of the data service and the application layer here. So we can very easily adhere new applications and we don't have to touch the data. Because if we have millions of triples here or, or even hundreds of millions of triples here, it would be very difficult to make any changes here. But on the application layer, you can more easily take care of different kind of, of, of uh, modifications. So for example, the war sample, if you go to the landing page, you can see these different application views here. There are today actually nine different application views like events, persons, army units, places, magazine articles, casualty databases, photographs, war cemeteries and prisoners of war. And all these applications provide a different kind of perspective to the same data, the war sample knowledge graph that you have here. And here's a picture of the, of the knowledge graph, then how it looks. There are now 14 million triples there, and, and you have there uh, different kind of uh, ontologies. So these green ones are ontologies. So we have a military unit ontology of, of 16,000 different military units. We have 100,000 persons in the person ontology here. We have 50, over 50,000 places, historical places mostly because we are dealing with the Second World War, over 2,000 2, occupations and so on. And then these, these yellow ones are then the, the data elements that or data records that we have, for example, death records, prisoner records, articles, war diaries, and, and 160,000 photographs. And these links here tell how many links there are between these, these sub data, data sets in the, in the knowledge graph. And the big picture is then, of course, that, that we have here a kind of linked data cloud that looks like this. But then, then if, you, if you look at it from, 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 from the global perspective and, and the linked open data cloud, uh, actually war sample is one of these bubbles here. So it's also interlinked to the international big, big uh, picture here. So, so the, this kind of interlinking can happen in different, different levels, levels as well. Uh, here's a picture of, of how the sample UI framework is then used in practice. Uh, so the idea there is that we have a faceted semantic uh, filtering search here on the left, where the idea is that you have different orthogonal facets that from which you can select here. So for example, here you have a selected uh, production place, uh, ancient Egypt here. And then you have a product date here. You have a selected uh, a range of, of years here. So we are looking now for Egyptian, ancient Egyptian manuscripts from this time period here. And then whenever you make a change here, you will get the result set here that, that is listed here as a table. And, and you can get, then if you click here, you can, you can get the particular manuscript or, or item here. And uh, the idea is that you, use, you filter out different subsets of your, your study. Uh, subject here, like manuscripts, 
the Egyptian manuscripts here. And then you have different kind of tabs here from which you can, you can then select the different kind of data analysis so that you can view the data that you have filtered out here in different ways. So for example, here's a view of all the manuscripts uh, from uh, where, where these, uh, these lines from red to blue illustrate how the manuscript has traveled during the hundreds of years from the place of production to the last known location. So you can see that most of the stuff has been created in Europe and then it goes to the United States, California and so on, and Australia and so on. So that's a basic idea. It will be shown in more detail in the, in the, in the videos that I, I will be showing here. So perhaps we could have a look at, at, the, at the war sample video. Uh, First, this, this system was, was published already in, in uh, 2015, but it has been extended with different uh, new application views uh, several times after that. Warsampo is a portal that contains information regarding the Finnish front of World War II, and it provides different perspectives of the war based on interlinked datasets. The Warsampo datasets have been compiled from multiple data sources. Datasets are interlinked, enriched with additional information, and published as linked open data. CDOC CRM is used as the harmonizing data model. From the portal, you can browse and explore the war sample datasets. For example, you can look up Paavo Talvela, a prominent figure in the Finnish military history. You can follow the movements of the person in timeline and on map. The heat map visualizes the casualties of war during the selected time window. You can view photos from the locations the person was situated in. You can see the course of the events of the continuation war and investigate detailed information of a military unit. You can see the locations of the events on history. Yeah, this maps. part of Finland is now Russia, so and get deeper insight by reading memories of soldiers enriched with contextual information. These are the memoirs of the soldiers after the war that they wrote in these magazines. Over 3000 articles. We are proving that Hegel was wrong, actually. <laughs> Hello, Hello. 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 This video Hello. introduces the letter sample yes, project okay. at the Aalto University and Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities Heldig. We are developing a framework and a demonstrator for publishing and analyzing historical epistolary data in digital humanities based on semantic web technologies. This new project in Finland was inspired by our earlier collaborations with the pan-European EU cost action reassembling the Republic of Letters and the University of Oxford, related to historical letters sent from the 16th to 19th century in Europe and beyond. Letters are always sent from a place to another and are therefore scattered in different archives in different countries, written in different languages. Harmonizing the metadata from separate data silos and aggregating the data into a semantically interoperable global service for digital humanities analyses makes a nice use case for the SAMPO model and SAMPO UI framework, developed at the Semantic Computing Research Group. The SAMPO model includes a collaborative business model for collaborative data publishing in a shared linked data service, the idea of accessing the data from multiple perspectives. 
the idea of integrating the service seamlessly with data analytic tools for research, and finally, a model for addressing research questions in two steps, where for seated search is first used for filtering out data of interest, and data analysis and visualizations are then applied to it. We next illustrate this idea by showing examples on analyzing letter data by using the letter sampo demonstrator. This is the main entry page for the letter sampo user interface. The application consists of three perspectives to the underlying data, the actors, the letters, and the places. The underlying dataset in this example contains information about a total of 34,000 actors. By actor we mean an individual person or group of people like universities or religious organizations. In the faceted search we can filter or search specific actors by their name, gender, or times of birth or death, or groups of actors for prosopographical research. For example we can search for the mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. On the result page we will see him among the other matches. The result table shows his years of birth and death and the amount of the letters involved, based on the underlying metadata. On the person landing page we will have even more information about him and his correspondences. In addition to showing his basic biographical information, the page contains fields for his alternative names and vocations. There is a list of all the other actors with whom he has been in contact. It should be emphasized that any visualization or data analysis in a system like Letter Sampo is an analysis of the underlying dataset, not of the real world. Any conclusions drawn from the analysis need source criticism and understanding the limitations of the data. For example, in this example there are 149 letters of Leibniz and the data misses lots of letters. Leibniz was a very active writer with some 15,000 letters and 1,100 correspondents. So in this case only 1% of those are available in the demonstrational dataset. In spite of this, analyzing an incomplete letter collection by distant reading can give novel insights to the researcher and collection manager, and suggest topics of interest for further close reading. The first person on the list is Christian Huygens, with whom he has sent 70 letters. As far as the data can tell us in this case, there are also detailed lists of all letters sent or received by him. The last result on this page shows a list of places he has been active and based on data about sending or receiving letters. The next tab, Network of Letters, shows a visualization of actors' egocentric network. The link width between two actors indicates the amount of mutual correspondence. The wider the link, the more letters has been sent between the two actors. We can like for instance spot that Leibniz sent 39 letters to Christian Huygens while Henry Oldenburg sent more than 200 letters to Huygens. Again, this analysis is based on data about only a fraction of Leibniz known letters. The next tab illustrates the number of letters on a timeline, where we can observe that the data is based on letters from two periods, the first one in the 1670s, and the second in the 1690s. This could indicate the collection manager that letters in between may be missing. The letter perspective page has a similar for seated search application as the actor page. Here we can browse and filter the data of 162,000 letters by their sender, receiver, date, language, subject, or data source. The second tab on the letter page visualizes the letter routes on a map application. Currently we are viewing the routes of letters sent from Paris. The third tab on the letter page demonstrates the amount of correspondences on a timeline. From this curve can be seen that the data is distributed from 16th to 19th century, with the majority of letters in the 17th century. In addition to the ready-to-use data views in letter sampo, the underlying Spark endpoint can be used easily for further data analyses using, for example, Python scripting in Google Colors. This data table shows the most active mathematicians and the data set, filtered out from the data. The left column shows the actors ranked by the number of letters sent, in the middle column ranking is based by the number of received letters, and on the right by the total amount of letters. The blue text color indicates that the actor has written more letters than what he has received. This is a visualization of the top writers between the years 1620 and 1770, and the ranking of the author is depicted on the y-axis, 
so that the highest ranking actor appears on the top of the diagram. Based on the underlying collection data, in the 1620s and 1630s Marin Marsen was at the highest rank. Christian Huygens was among the top writers during the years 1650-1690s. Isaac Newton has been an active writer in the late 17th and early 18th century. And finally we have Leonard Euler who's been the top writer during four decades from 1730s to 1760s. Thank you all for watching this video. More information about the Letter Sampo project is available at the web page of the Semantic Computing Research Group. Okay, and every publication that we have created in, pr in principle is available on these our web pages in, in PDF format. So we try to be as open as possible if you would like to have more information about these systems that I'm demonstrating here. Any questions regarding the, the re reassembling the le Republic of Letters case study? I will introduce the Academy SOMPA project. It is a project conducted in the Semantic Computing Research Group at Aalto University in Finland. This representation consists of three parts. First one will be a general introduction to the project. Then I will talk about the source data and how it was converted into linked open data and introduce the resulting data set. Finally I will represent some results of data analysis performed with the data. The Academy SOMPA project is an ongoing project started in the year 2019. The project aims at converting and publishing the material of Finnish student register as linked open data. The project is a part of SOMPA series of portals and a continuation to our projects of historical people ontologies, such as War SOMPA, Norset High School Register, and Biography SOMPA. The Finnish student register contains information about students of University of Helsinki, which originally was founded as the Royal Academy of Turku, because for a long time it was the only university in Finland, we may say that the data contains most of the people with academic education in Finland between the years 1640 and 1899. Conversion and Dataset In the source data each person has a semi-structured text description. The fields from that source data have been extracted using regular expressions. We have also utilized vocabularies of person names and occupations, and taken advantage of the possible, existing HTML formatting. The text description includes basic biographical information, like a person's name, his or her places and times of birth and death, and the occupation. In addition to that, the description contains academic events such as enrollment, being a member in a student nation, completing a thesis, and graduation. Furthermore, the description also contains information about a person's later career and related career events like employment. The description also mentions related people. When available, there is a list of a person's parents, spouses, and also other relatives who have studied at the University of Helsinki. Also the professor's or instructor's name is usually referred with the academic events. In total, the person ontology contains 28,000 students and 54,000 relatives mentioned in the descriptions. Machine learning methods were used to disambiguate the relatives mentioned in different descriptions. Our aim was to interlink the person references from the earlier data set to the later one. In total, there are 120,000 family relations connecting the students and their relatives, and 4,000 other relations, for example connecting a student with a teacher. The biographical data is enriched with 170,000 events, like births and deaths with events related to a person's career. In addition to people and event data, the entire data set uses domain ontologies of for example places, occupations, family relations, and student nations. The place ontology with 2,600 resources is custom made for this project. The ontology includes historical place names from for example Karelia, Baltic countries, and Central Europe. The data has many references to small villages located in Sweden, which were extracted from GeoNames data service. The ontology of occupations contains more than 10,000 descriptions. One such a description contains often a place names connected with an occupation, for example Bishop of Porvor, 
or Bishop of Turku. The occupations are linked to Ammo, Finnish ontology of historical occupations, which is a Finnish extension of HISCO, Historical International Standard Classification of Occupations. The ontology of family relations contains not only the close relatives, like parents, children, and spouses, but also more distant relations, like in-law relatives or relations reaching over several generations. The data publication contains also some smaller, domain-specific ontologies for representing for example student nations, categories, and organizations. The category data was included in the source data. The student nations and organizations were both extracted from the text descriptions. For representing the biographical information, an actor event-based schema is used. The schema is based on the CIDOC CRM standard. In addition to CIDOC CRM, BioCRM is used for representing person roles and interpersonal relations. BioCRM has been developed and used in our earlier projects on Norsi High School Register and Biography Sompa. In the actor event schema a person resource is enriched with events, which facilitates dealing with a possibly varying amount of data available for an individual person. The people in the register are represented as instances of the person class, and the mentioned relatives using the referenced person class. In the semantic representation, the resources of actor classes are enriched with lifetime events and relationships. Events, for example birth, death, or enrollment, are subclasses of the event class. Furthermore, the events are enriched by linkage to corresponding places, times, or occupations. Data Analysis This is a statistics view in the Academy Sompa user interface. By looking at the amount of people enrolled, it can be observed that before the 1870s, the number of enrollments remained at a relatively constant level. However, after that, this number starts increasing fast towards the end of the century. This is another timeline visualization, and it shows the number of students alive at each particular year. The number decreased in the early 18th century, during the time of the Great Northern War, and a plague epidemic. There are also some decreases in the late 18th and early 19th century, during the Russo-Swedish War, and the Finnish War after which Finland became an autonomous part of the Russian Empire. Finally, during the late half of the 19th century, there is a growth from slightly less than 4,000 into more than 8,000 students. This slide depicts the five most common occupational categories on a timeline. The curve on the top shows the total number of people in each category, while the bottom curve depicts the percentage. From the bottom image it can be seen that during the three centuries the proportion of religious occupations has decreased from 75 to mere 10%, respectively. The fields of public administration and education have had an increasing growth during the 19th century. In the universities in Sweden and Finland, the student nations were named after historical regions and the students had to join the student nation corresponding to their own geographical place of origin. This map visualization shows how the place of birth correlates with the student nation. The maps clearly shows how students of for example Tavastia, or Smallland nations concentrate on the corresponding regions. The data set is rich with the family relations. As a chosen example of the family networks, we have picked a family line starting from Josef Valeanius. 64 of his descendants have also been students at the university during the following seven generations. In addition to the family relations, the data set contains a network of teacher-student relations, spanning all the way from the 1640s to late 1800s. By network centrality measures, like page rank, the most central person in this network is Henrik Gabriel Porthan who has been the instructor or supervisor for more than 170 academic thesis. He was a professor and rector at the Royal Academy of Turku, and a scholar sometimes titled as the father of Finnish history. The two other central figures are the university professor and bishop of Turku, Jakob Gardolin, and professor and historian Algorth Skerin. I will now thank you all for listening. More information about the project is available at the web page of the Semantic Computing Research Group. 
Okay, perhaps we can we can have a look at the final final sample as well, and then then take the take the questions. Biographical dictionaries are scholarly resources used by the public and by the academic community alike. Their biographies usually combine a lengthy text with a supplement of basic facts, such as family, education, works, and so on. Biographies are an invaluable information source for researchers of history, but are available only as text for humans' readers and not as data for digital humanities applications. Biography Sampo makes a paradigm shift in publishing and using biographical dictionaries on the web based on linked data. The idea is to provide the user with enhanced reading experience of biographies by enriching contents with data linking and reasoning. In addition, versatile tooling for biographical research of individual persons as well as for prosopographical research on groups of people are provided. The system is based on a knowledge graph extracted automatically from a collection of 13,100 textual biographies written by 980 authors. The data was enriched with data linking to 16 external data sources, and by harvesting external collection data from libraries, museums, archives. The portal was released in September 2018 for free public use and quickly attracted tens of thousands of end users. Biography Sampo is a semantic portal that includes seven application perspectives for using the underlying linked data knowledge graph. By clicking on the first perspective a semantic faceted search view is opened for finding a protagonist or a group of them in flexible ways. Biography Sampo has reassembled for each protagonist a homepage based on the data extracted from the biographies and by data linking to external data sources. Here the homepage of Elil Sarinen, a prominent Finnish architect, is seen with six biographical descriptions and five data analytic views illustrating his life. Biography Sampo has also provided additional recommendation links to various related biographies. The lives are represented as sequences of spatio-temporal events that the person has participated in different roles, based on an extension of the Cydoc CRM data model. For example, here the events of Elil Sarinen are depicted as a list, on a timeline, and on a map. By clicking on another tab the egocentric network of Elil Sarinen is visualized. As an example for using the system for prosopography, let us click on the life maps view on the front page. Now the faceted search can be used for filtering out a target group of interest. Here the generals and admirals of Finland in the 19th century. Their lives are now visualized as blue-red arrows from place of birth to place of death. Clearly, the soldiers moved to the south when they retired as the retirees do today. By clicking on the arrows the biographs about the related persons can be found. Here the arrow to Siberia is due to General Gustav Silverhelm's biography. The prosopographical views can always be used for two groups or making comparisons. Here the user compare the life maps of the soldiers with those of the clergy in the 19th century. The priests clearly stayed more often in Finland. In addition to visualizations like this the user can also create various statistics of filtered target groups and find out and analyze networks within the groups. It is also possible to analyze the language of the biographies. For example, the words family and child occur often in the biographies of female Finnish members of parliament but seldom in the biographies of men. In yet another application view the user can solve problems using relational search and artificial intelligence. In this view the user formulated the query, how are Finnish artists related to Italy? using selections in the facets on the left. Biography Sampo found out the relations with natural language explanations such as Ellen Danielson Gambogi got in 1899 the Florence City Award.
okay, uh, just to cap uh, up. Uh, so the sample series that I have demonstrated here, I think they demonstrated the paradigm shift in four generations of publishing data for humanities. Everything started with printed texts, then came online systems for searching and exploring the data. This is the sort of state of the art at the moment in most places on earth. And, and the samples are, are already on the third level, so to say, where we publish content and link data, but together with seamlessly integrated tools for digital humanities research. So it's not only searching and exploring, but also analyzing the data. And, and some parts of, of, of uh, sample, like, like the latest uh, example in the in the biography sample video was uh, that, that we are actually actually now aiming at automatic knowledge discovery and artificial intelligence where, where the system can intelligently find out research questions and even solve the problems and and uh, and sometimes also explain the reasons for the solution so so there is lots of research to be done at that area but but this is where we would like to go in the future but uh, it may look nice even if, but uh, the lunch is not free i think there are lots of lots of also things to be considered uh, in addition to, to uh, creating this kind of system. First of all, uh, using the linked data and the infrastructure uh, means that more collaboration is needed from the, from the content provider's point of view, which complicates work. Or, or the other way around that, that we do the data integration and, and alignment of the data, which we are doing, and it, it's, it's horrible work. We don't want to do that. That's why we are creating the infrastructure. Uh, then another question is integration of, of the semantic portals to legacy systems. And this is something that we, have, we are now, now discussing with, with various collaborators that we are working with, because, because these guys don't know the technology. And, uh, and uh, so how could they then, then uh, for example, maintain the systems that we are now, now uh, running on our own, own servers? So, so there's lots of, lots of work to be done so that we can, we can, we can really sustainable keep these systems up and running. Uh, then the manual annotations that are needed in linked data are costly if we do it manually uh, or otherwise these annotations don't scale up and, and that's why we are actually using more and more these automatic annotation and knowledge extraction tools but then the quality of the data is of course not as good as, as when, when the human catalogers or, or historians create the data so so whatever you do you are in trouble <laughs> in, at least to some extent and then I think the most important thing is, is here written in, in red that we have learned that when you are using systems like the samples, they are completely different in many ways from, from what people perhaps are used to. Uh, more source criticism and data literacy are needed because you have to understand what is actually happening there uh, behind, behind the skin, so to say. So, for example, what the data actually is and what it means, this is not always clear when you are using these systems unless you, do, you, should, you know what the data is there. So you have to be, try to make the systems as transparent as possible so that the user knows what kind of data he or she is dealing with. And then, of course, when you're dealing with big data, the quality issues are, are, are huge there. Uh, uh, there were also already some examples in the, in the videos about the completeness problem, for example, Leibniz letters, for example. If you're using this kind of, of tools for making some, some uh, conclusions about uh, Leibniz correspondence and you only have 1%, even if that's already quite a, while, quite a lot of letters there, then you can go completely wrong unless you are very careful there. The data is in many ways skewed. skewed. For example, in the biography uh, uh, sample case, uh, the biographies that we have there, they have been selected by the editorial board. Uh, and, and for example, if we try to uh, used uh, some kind of make some kind of assumptions that whether they represent the, the whole Finland or what kind of part of Finland they are actually representing. You, you must be very careful there because because it's it's a based on, on on a selection of people made by some people and and so so this kind of system, for example, biography sample is it's more like a historiographical system than 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 anything else. And then, of course, there are lots of errors. You have to tolerate these errors because we make things automatically. We don't have time to, to annotate by hand these huge data sets, uh, and, but we have to rely on, on, on the computer and the computer makes errors much more often than, than humans do. So, so we have to sort of tolerate that the systems are not perfect. But I think that even if there are errors and you can spot them there, 
uh, they can, if you are aware of them, uh, the system can still be very useful. So in conclusion, here are some, some uh, websites that, that you may find interesting if you're interested in more, more detailed descriptions of the systems and, and links to the actual, actual systems online. So everything is, is available in, in, in uh, the publications are available and, and, and the software and data, we, we publish everything that we can as open data. Okay, thank you. If you have any, any questions, we could perhaps discuss them now. Yeah, thank you Aaron, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation and this very uh, ambitious and very uh, uh, far reaching uh, set of uh, different uh, portals and uh, yeah, around uh, the common ontology.